What have in common this rusty steel pipe, this piece of rotten wood and uh, this mask? Hello everybody and welcome back! Today I'm gonna talk about uh, electronics, physics uh, and this! Right now, while I'm talking, I'm ejecting thousands and thousands of tiny droplets of muhus, which is primarily made of water. You can see them, but they are there. All we have learned that even air has water, right? But it is not a kind of water, it is vapor. Okay, okay, when I talk about vapor, you probably think at this. However, this is condensed water, not vapor. Vapor is a molecule of water in a gaseous form, not liquid, and it is completely transparent. What you are seeing here is water in gaseous form that rises from the liquid hot water in the pot, blending with the air above it. As this hot, very humid air goes away enough from the pot, it loses temperature and becomes saturated of the gaseous water contained in it. This causes the precipitation of the gas water into its liquid form in billions of droplets that remain suspended in air. This suspension is called aerosol. Those are tiny droplets, but they are so many that we can see them. It is important to distinguish between the two forms of water because they react very differently. Mold grows thanks to liquid water, not gas. Droplets of water have the tendency to stick to many surfaces, even a very tiny grain of dust. And once attached to the wood, the water provides one of the components required for the development of the spores that make the mold. Iron or steel, for the matter, don't rust if simply exposed in the air. You can even put a piece of iron under water, but it won't rust as fast as if it were covered by a very thin, invisible to the naked eye layer of water droplets. To understand this, we have to go into a little bit of chemistry. Rust is not a direct product of the oxidation of iron. At room temperature, when iron comes in contact with oxygen present in the air, it forms uh, both fer ferric oxide, which is this reddish pedna, uh, and uh, magnetite, uh, or ferrous oxide, which is this black pedna. And this black pedna protects, protects the iron from further oxidation. Uh, while, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, ferric oxides, uh, this reddish one, when mint water, uh, becomes hydrated and hydrated ferric oxide is the technical name for rust, which is this one. Uh, and unlike the dehydrated form that is this one, uh, this kind of oxide flakes off. Uh, as you can see here, it, it flakes off and, uh, and it makes uh, the underlying metal exposed to further oxidation to the point that uh, it can eat up all the iron or steel eventually. So to recap, while ferric oxide and ferric oxides uh, are generated when uh, iron comes in contact with air, with the oxygen in the air, uh, it's water that makes it hydrated or rusty. And minuscule droplets of water are worse than just uh, full water because they embed air carrying more oxygen, so we have the full receptor to make rust. <laughs> Mold, rust and mucus that can potentially carry infectious disease, three things that are related to practically invisible droplets of water or mostly made of water, three good reasons to be able to detect and possibly quantify such invisible droplets. And here comes this device. It is an electronic sensor that provides a signal proportional to the amount of water particles that are in proximity to its sensitive surface. This is different from humidity sensor as humidity sensors detect water in gaseous form, while this sensor detects the proximity or the buildup of droplets or particles of water. The sensor exploits the fact that uh, the, the electric coefficient of uh, water is 80 times larger than the coefficient uh, of air. So I've made a circuit that generates a, a variable electric field uh, and a detector that uh, measures the capacitance uh, held through such electric field. 
Then I designed a sensitive surface with a network of flat electrodes that amplify the uh, projection, projection of the electric fields above it. When a particle of water, or mostly containing water, enters into the field's projection, it rises the capacitance influencing the mutual capacitance that comes from the compound of the electrodes of the air and the particle of water. The more the particles come into the projection, the more the capacitance. And to some extent it works as in what are known as uh, projected capacitance devices. And you are familiar with them because they are largely used in uh, touch screens. But they are not meant to be as sensitive and precise as this one and are quite different in design. The capacitance detector reacts to very tiny variation in capacitance, so to return and manageable information, it provides a pulse with coded signal. Also, a further element in the circuit provides the power stealing it from the uh, very same line that uh, carry the information. So just one wire is required to connect the sensor to a processor. Power management is important to reduce the risk the sensor's self-heating that otherwise would introduce a perturbance in the measurement with spurious energy. That energy would end up to influence the status of the particles of water introducing prem premature evaporation and consequently altering the measurement. To understand better how the sensor works, uh, uh, let's avoid the details of the electronic schematics of the circuit. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, functional diagram uh, where here we have the current source, a current source and uh, a capacitor which represent the um, sensitive oh, shit which represent the sensitive area of the, of the sensor and together uh, creates the progressive um, electric field that is, that is used to detect the water particles. And through an amplifier the signal uh, goes to a comparator that in turn goes to a pulse generator that uh, on one side uh, provide control to the discharge of the capacitor when the measurement is done and on the other side drive, uh, control the driver, the output driver that uh, um, from which the parasite power is picked up from an external microcontroller that receives both the signals and provide the power and control the power cycle of the uh, sensor to limit the self-heat. Uh, it is, uh, in, in its essence, it is a pretty simple, uh, s basically it is pretty simple circuit, uh, but the trick is in the design and the selection of the components and uh, and the and the layout <laughs> of the circuit and it's quite tricky. This device took me a lot of time in development. I also tested several prototypes uh, and different uh, um, sensitive parts, uh, sensitive area, uh, with different designs uh, to uh, to to see uh, the differences in sensitivity and, uh, and capability of the sensor. And it turned out that the last version was uh, sensitive enough to detect uh, even the tiny droplets uh, ejected when, the, when we breathe hard. So it was used for uh, research uh, to assess the effectiveness of uh, face masks. And quite interesting. <laughs> Applications can be risk assessment of mold growth in buildings, farms, crop storage, and the similar food quality control. Also, a fourth application could be control of water condensation in machines, warehouses, and the magazines or storage of tools or electronic components. With some changes on the sensitive surface, it can be used even to reliably detect rain. Maybe you could have some more ideas of other possible applications, so let me know in the comments section below. That's all folks for today. 
I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please click the thumb up icon. Also, don't be secretive. Let's share the link of the video with other people. And if you don't want to miss future upload of videos from me, consider to subscribe and click the bell icon. Okay, I think I have said everything. Bye. Oh, wait. Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. And I wish you good luck and good health. Goodbye. See you next time.